thank you to everyone who has joined. Thank you very much to Susan for joining us on this Tech for Sustainability live chat. So Susan is uh, from Ampere, a, a, an aviation company who put the, the first electric hybrid plane and they're, they're working on some really exciting concepts for uh, electric and sustainable air travel. And, and we're talking about totally new shapes and styles of, of planes that I'd never even heard about before. So very excited to hear uh, more from Susan. So um, Suzanne, just for uh, an overview, has been working in, in aerospace for over 30 years. She's worked at NASA, at Boeing, at the uh, Commercial Aircraft Corporation of China, um, and also has a commercial pilot's license, is a certified flight instructor, and has a PhD in aeronautics and astronautics from Stanford University, as well as a whole host of other experience. So probably the most qualified person we could have possibly got to speak about the future of of air travel so so very very excited to have um susan joining us um just a, as an overview huge thank you to tracer so tracer are a, a, a blockchain platform for the diamond industry a, a connected value chain platform so they've been working on um with the the diamond industry to foster a culture of innovation and and working on creating sustainable business practices and ensuring consumer trust in the diamond industry such as ensuring that there's no um, flood diamonds and as well as ensuring that all their communities are fairly and well paid that they work with um, and really proactively working with those local communities where the diamonds are mined so hugely grateful to Tracer for sponsoring and supporting this tech for sustainability series so anyone can find out more about how they're working with the diamond industry and also other um, other metal and mineral industries at community.tracer.com and so Susan Thank you for joining us. To everyone who has um, joined as an attendee, look forward to hearing from you. All right, thanks. Well, uh, good afternoon or good evening, everybody. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you all and talk about what's next for aviation. Um, so first, a little bit on Ampere. Uh, we are a startup uh, that started up in 2016 in uh, Los Angeles. And uh, currently we have uh, 15 employees and um, we have also global footprint. In fact, uh, I was just sharing just now that I will be going to the uh, UK and start up uh, two of very exciting projects with our UK partners. And also we have a, a small subsidiary also in China. Okay. Um, so we are all uh, in this uh, jet age right now, which is, um, you know, the, the fastest means of transportation uh, if you're going anywhere on the surface of Earth right now. And uh, so the jet age, uh, in fact, uh, the whole aviation history is about 100 years and we, we were in the jet age for about 70 years now. And uh, these jets uh, uh, really help connect us from the different continents and everywhere. And we can fly f very high, you know, higher and faster, uh, but also uh, it has uh, the downside, which is uh, uh, the aviation, the jets uh, very uh, contributes to um, about 3.5%. Uh, I just saw the revised number today, actually 3.5% to the global warming or uh, namely 900 million tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere per year. So that's something that's really awful. And uh, we wanna correct that, we wanna clean up our act. And um, so in this chart, you can see that uh, it's a uh, uh, report that's uh, uh, based on the various sectors of uh, industry. So you have the uh, heating, transportation, ground transportation, and uh, electricity, uh, aviation, and uh, agriculture, and waste uh, treatment, and so on. So this is an analysis for the UK, and uh, you know, from 1990 all the way to 2050. And so as you can see, there's uh, several scenarios. And uh, as uh, from 1990, when aviation was only 4% of the overall uh, in terms of contribution to the equivalent carbon dioxide. And um, by 2017, it's grown to 12% already. And then uh, by 20, 2050, we have 
these uh, different scenarios. And if all these other sectors are doing their thing to clean up, aviation could eventually become the worst, uh, you know, like 44% or 46% of the overall uh, for the climate impact. So that's very alarming. And so let's just talk about uh, the fuel dependency and fuel efficiency in aviation. So this is a, a, a trip, for example, from the uh, Seattle, uh, which is on the West Coast, to uh, the East Coast, uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, in the U.S. And now, um, assuming that it's 80% load factor, load factor is just how full you have in the aircraft. And so for uh, an aircraft of 80% uh, full for 160 passenger airplane and flying that, I'm sorry, we're still using the US miles and gallons here. <laughs> so uh, for that many miles, that many gallons, and then dividing out by the 130 passenger for the only 80% full, then uh, we're actually getting 29 gallon per passenger. So all you have to do is contribute 29 gallons uh, for such a flight. And so when you divide it out for the overall in terms of the passenger miles per gallon uh, efficiency for this airplane, it's actually really good. It's at 81 passenger mile per gallon comparing to like, for example, uh, for a car, typical car in California, for example, is like around, you know, uh, 25, you know, for each trip, but then for 1.3 passengers, about 32 passenger mile per gallon. And then uh, the 737 MAX and also A3, A3, A320 uh, NEO, for example, they will be at somewhere around 100 passenger mile per gallon. So they're very, very efficient already in terms of the, the fuel efficiency. But in 2011, there was a, a, a kind of a grand challenge between um, you know, several of the newer uh, electric airplanes. And so they're competing on just how much more efficient they can be comparing to these uh, conventional airplanes. And so Pipistro, uh, which is a small electric airplane company at that time, uh, in fact, it's a Pipistro USA team. They, their entry at the time uh, was a four-seater uh, airplane. Uh, could obtain 400, uh, 403.5 passenger mile per gallon, the equivalent. Of course, it doesn't take fuel, but um, this will be calculating its energy from the, uh, from the grid. So that's uh, already four times uh, more ex efficiency than the 737, which is 737 max, actually. So that's very, very efficient. Um, However, um, you know, like this uh, cartoon indicated, uh, in order to do something like that with a 737, you're gonna need a huge, huge battery. I mean, for that little airplane, which is fine, but for such a big airplane, it's a huge battery. And also there's uh, the safety issues and so on. But here's the question, do we really need uh, the all electric 737 size airplanes? For the fossil fuel airplanes, and so you can see this, you know, I, I came from Southeast Asia originally, and, um, and so you could still see, and I heard from people that you could still see something like that today in some parts of uh, the Southeast Asia. And uh, so in order to get passenger miles per gallon, um, I think people are really smart. They just pile as many people as possible onto the vehicle and you get really large number of passenger miles per gallon. But you can't do that with airplanes. And uh, also with the electric airplanes, we have found out, you know, for that small airplane, you don't need the size and number of people in order to get such a, uh, the, namely the load factor to get the efficiency. So um, last year, I was fortunate enough to uh, fly that Pipistro that um, we saw just now with a 400, uh, well, not exactly the same airplane, but this one is a two seat. And uh, so I flew that in Australia, uh, Norway, and um, the top left one is in uh, Finland. And so that airplane uh, is the, currently the only one in the world that has been certified by, uh, by EASA, by Certification uh, regu regu Regulatory Group. And uh, as you can see here, you know, it requires charging and there's a little charger that they have developed to sell together with the airplane. So this airplane, uh, after I flew you know, with uh, these friends uh, from Finland and Australia and Norway, I asked them because, you know, I want to put in my share of, uh, you know, contribution to, <laughs> to using the airplane. 
And so I asked them, well, you know, how much should I pay? And uh, my Australian friend actually told me uh, three Australian dollars. And I was shocked at the time. I say three Australian, which is less than two US dollars at the time. And then uh, for Finland and for Norway, they say, no, no, you know, it's probably one euro or something. I say one euro. And uh, for, for Finland and Norway, they have their own uh, currency. That was just incredible. So um, then I started doing some analysis just to figure out just, you know, the, the kind of efficiency and the kind of comparison for uh, the operating costs. And so when I, uh, so this is a, a Cessna 152 in comparison, which is a two seater you can see on this picture here. Um, in fact, that's the picture I used for, for solo and getting my flight uh, pilot license. And so for that airplane, in fact, that's a very old airplane, um, designed built back in the 60s, uh, actually late 50s, uh, early 60s. And so the energy consumption per hour is around uh, $34 and the uh, annual would cost, uh, you know, let's say for the airframe around $18 and annual for the power plant is around $12. And, uh, and then it has to, you know, you have a flight because you have the oil, the piston engine. So <laughs> oil is around $3 uh, power. And so the operating cost altogether is 67. That doesn't include if you want to hanger it or tie it down or whatever. So if you add up everything and if you want to take flight lessons in those airplanes, it's uh, um, north of $100 actually. But let's just say the typical, if you're an owner, uh, you, you, you don't have any other costs and so this is a uh, does not include the uh, the ownership costs and how much you bought it and your hangar fees and so estimating at the time you know I wanted to estimate just how much uh, the uh, the pipistrelle will cost and so this this is really the comparison at the time I used the three dollars and <laughs> for conservative and then uh, inspection you know, per year, you know, after I, I talk to people, it's around $2. And of course, you may have to replace the battery after so many hours. And then the power plant inspection, um, you will see the power plant uh, could be very, very simple uh, in uh, some pictures in this deck later. And it doesn't use oil. So the overall operating cost per hour, I estimated was uh, $14. And uh, so the big difference will be, you know, 90, 80 to 90 percent. Uh, the total cost will be 80 percent down. And, uh, you know, so definitely the energy cost will be a huge, huge difference. And um, so this is a chart that I did a screen uh, capture from a recent talk that uh, Tina, who's the CTO of Pipistrol, who gave this talk and show that these are the actual numbers uh, on the lower right that you, you're seeing. So the energy cost per hour is indeed even less than one euro uh, per hour. And the operating cost per hour, they're estimated 17 euros. And of course, you know, this depends on the labor in Europe versus the labor in the US and so on. And then the total cost per hour, his estimate was uh, 33 euros. So uh, if you remember, or uh, let's see just you know, how it compares to what I uh, shared earlier. So uh, those are the two numbers that uh, from uh, Pipistrelles themselves. But uh, some of the, I mean, aside from just the fuel, but the maintenance cost is, uh, is really one of the biggest uh, difference. So let's just uh, take a quick uh, look at that. And, uh, and oh, instead of 80%, it's 70%, but that's still dramatic. I mean, that's huge in terms of difference. So, um, you know, I know many, many people here in the U.S. who want to learn how to fly, but, you know, at $100 an hour, I'm, usually when you go to flight school, it's, you know, you have to also pay for it. CFI, the, the instructor, and so on. It's, it's really $100 to $200 an hour to learn. And then altogether, you need, uh, you know, at least like 80 to 100 hours for getting a license now. And so that's just so un unaffordable, but look at this number now. I mean, it is so different. And so um, if you take a look at some of the components, so this is uh, the, the motor. In fact, this, this guy is uh, Corey Combs, our, our CTO, and uh, he's holding this motor, okay, for, for the airplane. And this, uh, the gentleman on the right, he, he's the uh, uh, director of Department of Inter uh, International Trade for the UK.
And so we're giving a, a lab tour and Corey was holding this motor. And, you know, I challenge anybody who can actually hold the, the piston engine of the uh, Cessna 150 that, you know, in that little picture that you show, you, you saw earlier, it's just impossible. I mean, in terms of the weight, everybody's talking about the weight of the battery and so on, but the weight of the motor, there's a, there's a huge weight difference there as well. So now let's take a look at the other component, like the battery, because, uh, you know, indeed there's a huge difference in terms of the energy, uh, energy density of the batteries required versus the energy uh, density that we get from fossil fuel. But it's improving very, very fast. And also, more importantly, in the uh, lithium ion battery, the price uh, is dropping. Like, you know, for example, in this chart, you can see it's dropping 85% price in eight years. And not only that, uh, there's more and more people uh, that are uh, manufacturing these, and particularly in China. So you can see, uh, you know, in the, in the world, by uh, 2028, there's gonna be 22 gigafactories and China has a, a huge share of that. So that's in terms of battery. And now in terms of the airplane, what we wanna do, we, we know the key here in terms of innovation is in energy and particularly is energy optimization. Just like you know, the way how you're gonna uh, architect a house, architecting an energy, uh, an, an airplane system you can optimize on energy. You know, you build a house that um, can optimize on energy. You may want to face have your uh, have your windows face different directions. You know, making use of uh, the sun, the solar rays, or you know, you can have certain materials for uh, insulation and things like that. So, our idea is to have totally en uh, energy optimized aircraft by doing the uh, integration of the energy system. So for example, uh, this particular airplane here you're seeing is our tail tailwind, uh, which is our uh, patented airplane. As you can see, it has a very nice clean aerodynamic surface. And on the back, it totally replaced the tail section of the airplane by what was called a boundary ingestion unit, which is BLI with a fan uh, inside. So what this is, is that not only it's a propulsion unit, but it also helps to suck off the boundary layers from the, from, uh, from the fuselage, which generates the drag. And, um, and here's another uh, example. This is not an Ampere example, but it's from uh, Impossible Arrow for the, uh, for the drones. So remember the energy density is very important for the whole airplane. It's not just the battery energy density, but the overall energy density because you have to have the whole overall weight to be taken off. So in this case, uh, it's, this architecture is totally having the batteries being its, um, being its uh, structure system. And then here's another example of, uh, this is a NASA's example of the X-57 uh, experimental uh, aircraft. As you can see, uh, some biggest difference here is uh, the wing uh, looks slightly smaller than the, uh, the typical airplane wing. And that's because the typical, uh, and, uh, the typical airplane wings and everything is uh, sized such that it will lift the weight of the whole thing. Well, in this case, uh, for the lift over drag uh, aerodynamic uh, ratio, well, as in this case, it uses these uh, propulsors or um, what we call a distributed propulsion all along the wing to help with a high lift scenario. And not only that, the typical propulsion, uh, which is you know, from the fossil fuel design is such that it's designed separately from the airframe and it's sized for the maximum requirement of energy, namely for taking off. You know, when you take off, uh, you're defying the gravity from zero, you know, from right on the ground to, to the altitude. And so, uh, but the thing is that well, during cruise, you got to throttle back to, you know, something that's smaller than the maximum uh, thrust that you need. But then you're carrying all that weight of the propulsion. So this is a uh, example such that um, it uses uh, that principle by using the propulsor for, for the, uh, for the lift and weight, and also for the uh, uh, thrust that's uh, distributed along the wing surface. And it also has these tip propulsors making use of the tip uh, wingtip vortices uh, because that would help also. So it's a very well integrated uh, propulsion airframe integrated airplane. And this one is the unpaired design. 
And so as uh, we mentioned that uh, Ampere is trying to design the energy optimized aircraft. So we start from the energy system and um, we use a approach much like Tesla did. So what Tesla had done was that it started out not going right into an air, uh, not right into a new car, but it actually start with the propulsion system and use the, the old uh, Porsche and other uh, just regular car frame for its uh, ba battery and uh, energy system. So we use the same principle and we use this airplane, which is the um, Cessna Skymaster. And the Skymaster has uh, a six seat actually, but uh, in this version we showed only uh, four seats. And we replace, it's a twin, it's a inline uh, twin instead of uh, side by side, left and right. And so uh, in terms of stability wise, it's uh, uh, a lot simpler to balance, especially when there's a failure in one of them. So we keep the, in this version, we keep the front engine, fossil fuel engine, and then we replace the back with our design. As you can see, it's much more simpler and the motor inverter uh, system and then having the uh, power, uh, electricity energy drawn from the battery, which is on the belly here with all these uh, batteries. So our design is uh, philosophy is from inside to outside. And then of course we'll scale from small to large. And so in, in this case, uh, what we have is a, uh, uh, a roadmap starting from the, uh, basically the six seat Skymaster and preliminary design of the 19 passenger. Uh, this one is a 19 passenger uh, eco otter. And uh, so we can reduce up to 70% uh, based on of uh, emission. And also we can reduce the energy requirement by 70% uh, using the uh, change propulsion plan. So today we're electrifying these aircraft to hybrids on a case by case basis uh, using our uh, proprietary technologies. And this can be applied to many or thousands of existing planes. And we work with airport partners, energy providers and infrastructure stakeholders to develop and demonstrate use cases. And then tomorrow we will partner with uh, major OEMs to reduce uh, conventional, replace, excuse me, conventional engines uh, with uh, low emission technologies. Uh, and then we can scale to dozens of aircraft types and also hundreds of units per year. And uh, beyond uh, tomorrow, uh, the fully electric future of aviation will be built on the foundation we pioneered today. Our energy optimized aircraft solutions uh, will unlock revolutionary designs, capabilities, value, and environmental challenges. So um, the next thing is uh, really, really exciting here. Um, so current regional flights are serviced by about 30 to 90 passenger turboprops and small regional jets in a hubs and spokes model with uh, connecting flights. Now, these operations attain higher load factors for needed efficiency per flight, but at the cost of hub congestions, passenger inconvenience, and higher total trip emission per passenger because there are indirect flight paths. So since the pandemic, uh, several regional airlines already dropped the services of uh, connecting regional flights to the, particularly the secondary uh, cities or second tier cities. Um, examples are uh, American Airlines and Express Jets here in the US. I'm sure in the UK, there's quite a few as well. Now the electric aircraft does not require the high load factor as we have seen and, um, but they do achieve higher efficiency. So they can enable the shift to the point-to-point -point service on a viable short or thin haul routes between secondary city pairs or village pairs. Now, the, uh, the similar trend has already been observed for the intercontinental flights where more efficient Boeing 787s and A350s in point-to-point -point services have already replaced the A380 services of these uh, hubs and spokes flights. So this will unlock the hidden potential of many underutilized airports and giving communities better accessibility than ever before. And so for the US, this could be tenfold increase to the current destinations. And in other parts of the world, such as Asia, Africa, there could be 
many new destinations for connectivity of sustainable flights. And um, so as we uh, uh, try to introduce these electric airplanes in, into the market, um, of course, there's three uh, components here that one is, of course, the market itself. There has, there has to be the need, there has to be um, the demand. And um, so having the economics uh, that I think the, the, the market is, could be quite sound and it could be really disrupting as well uh, from that shift we just saw. And then there's the uh, technology piece. But also for airplane, it's an industry that, you know, safety is very, very, uh, you know, of paramount importance. And so uh, there's a regulatory or certification requirement. And so for that, we're working with um, uh, FAA and EASA, as well as uh, CAAC and, you know, these regulatory groups. But also, you know, when they certify these airplanes, these airplanes have to be certified to the common standards. Now, these are common strict standards, and many of these uh, do not exist yet because, for example, we didn't used to have the motor, the electric motor for uh, flying as a propulsion means. And so these new standards must be developed uh, at the same time. So we're working with uh, international standards groups such as SAE, ASTM, and GAMA, and so on. So, uh, so that's great, but um, also to achieve the, um, the goal of sustainable aviation will take a systems approach and uh, the system will include definitely the airports and so on. So this is why here you've seen uh, some of the airports groups. And uh, so in this systems approach, we got to include the eco chain of partners. So in particular, the source and the process of the energy for flight must be sustainable. Otherwise, we're just really shifting the problem. And creating on-site energy generation, storage, and charging stations at the airports is essential for enabling the all-electric future of aviation, but also provides immediate benefit to both airports and surrounding communities. Now, airports can generate electricity through solar or wind, as you see in these pictures, and or other renewable sources to be paired with energy storage system to reduce uh, electricity costs during the peak usage times. Uh, especially, you can imagine these megawatt airplanes all show up at the same time. You know, it's, it's uh, very demanding on the uh, energy infrastructure. So the charging system uh, can be built up around electri electrified airports and serve as uh, charging and transit hubs in the surrounding communities increasing the mobility and facilitating the broader multimodal electric transportation. Now, when hybrid and all electric aircraft are widely developed, the infrastructure will facilitate operations, further reducing emissions while keeping the regional communities connected. And so these infrastructures uh, development is key and it's a key enabler, stakeholder and partner for the sustainable aviation. Um, so in the UK, so in the uh, chart just now, you see some of the big airports in the US. That's where they're starting a lot of that. But even then, um, like uh, what you saw are like in terms of one to two or even 20 megawatts, which is still not enough. Now in the UK, there's uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, activities also, particularly um, uh, in Scotland, the Scottish uh, islands. And also in the southwest, uh, southwest part of the UK, and uh, such as uh, at Exeter Airport, at uh, Cornwall Airport. And so these are some of the activities that Unpair will soon uh, be engaged in. And it's, it's very, very exciting. And so um, the next uh, for Unpair uh, in the next month, actually, that we're going to do is uh, we're going to take the airplane to Maui. And uh, in this particular airplane, we actually, because uh, last year we flew the airplane, but the batteries were actually set inside the aircraft and the electric propulsion means is uh, in the back. But this year we actually, uh, in this particular one, we're taking to Hawaii. It's for a uh, market survey flight. Namely, we can take passenger or we can take uh, some customer on, on the flight. So what we're doing is that we, we're keeping the seats open now instead of uh, putting the battery here. We have these um, batteries in the belly pot, just like the picture you saw earlier. 
and then we're changing the front to be electric. And so in so doing, you can see the con contrast in terms of the, uh, um, the energy savings uh, resulting in how much it's gonna cost uh, in this particular one. And then also in terms of time saving, because from uh, Kahului to Hana, basically, right now is a two, more than two hours drive. Uh, maybe some of you might have driven that. It's a very scenic drive, but it takes a long time. But flying is uh, only 15 minutes. And um, so with that, I think um, I will uh, open for uh, some questions you might have. And so this is a team, as I mentioned earlier, we have a very, very uh, capable team of 15. And I think some of those are, are not in this picture. But um, well, thank you again. And uh, I, I'm uh, happy to entertain your questions now. What TRN level are you at? And you know, what, what would, how, what is your addressable market? How, how do you quantify your addressable market? So the TRL level is, uh, I mean, it's already like uh, eight or nine. I mean, obviously we got it all in. Uh, the only part is the, uh, the battery is moving very fast. And I mean, the battery improvement is moving very fast. And so uh, we may be able to uh, try some of the batteries that might even be, uh, you know, six or seven but uh, it's gotta be high. Uh, we're not working with uh, TRL at three or four because that will be just too risky for the program. And mainly because we gotta go to market. Uh, in fact, I, I don't think I mentioned that, but um, the uh, airplane that's uh, 19 seat, we we'll call the Eco Otter. Uh, we plan to have that fly by 2023. And incidentally, the four, uh, the, the, uh, the six seed uh, hybrid, that's the Cessna Skymaster, um, was the first, the largest uh, first hybrid that's flown. So we plan to get the 19 seed to be the largest that's flown, uh, the, large, the first to, to fly. And uh, we're planning for 2023. And so anything less than uh, TRL six or seven is, is too risky at this point. What is TRL for us? Oh, um, so TRL is the uh, technology readiness level. And mm -hmm. um, I think it started by the, Na it's, it's, it's a definition that NASA has started using a long, long time ago. And I think the whole industry just basically adopted that term. Okay, no, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, David is asking uh, regarding certifications, how long could it take to certify a full electric regional airport? Ah, airport or airplane? Airport, air, aircraft, sorry. Oh. Aircraft, <laughs> aircraft, aircraft. Was... Okay, well, that's a really good question. And, uh, you know, uh, how long, I guess, is tied to the question of how fast you can uh, finance <laughs> your process mm -hmm. because um, uh, so for example the uh, some of the earlier example of the fossil fuel uh, development uh, it took uh, it could take anywhere you know between three to five years to ten years even or um, the whole development process could take a long time. Like Honda Jet was one of the last jets, you know, small jets that have been uh, certified. Uh, it took them, uh, well, 30 years in development. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the finance took uh, like in terms of billion. Um, but for something like four seat, uh, it could be less. Uh, it's really uh, how fast you can um, finance your development process mm -hmm. and uh, it would be like around hundreds of millions of dollars. And wow. so if you can get this uh, finance fast and get the people, um, it would be shorter uh, time frame. But even then, because in this case, uh, it's, as I mentioned, the certification requires some of the new standards. And new standards don't just come like, okay, you write a standard today, tomorrow is published, <laughs> because you have to sit down together with a whole group of uh, people from the industry, because, you know, the, the standard one company develops, for example, would only be good for 
their type of product. And, and so you, you need a whole consortium of industries there to uh, discuss together and agree on. And then the regulator, of course, also participate in that. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a process that can take time. Yeah. But so far, it's very encouraging because the two-seaters uh, already been certified by EASA. So I think in this case, EASA is moving uh, a bit faster than the FAA. Uh, and, um, and so that's one of the reasons why, you know, uh, Unpair is also uh, having a footprint in the UK. We, we mm -hmm. want to work with the UK CAA as well. And, uh, and so because all these uh, certifications, uh, you know, as, as you can probably uh, expect, that there's a lot of bilateral agreements between YASA, FAA, and also today I saw YASA and China, CAA, uh, also have the bilateral agreement. Mm -hmm. Namely, once they have uh, certified something, then the, the other government who have these bilateral agreement would also agree to be certified. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's very encouraging and um, we're working towards that. And so in terms of four seat, I think uh, you could see like within the uh, next uh, two to three years, uh, but 19 seat, uh, probably five years. Okay. No, thank you, thank you. Um, on that note, so Rohit is asking, what are the challenges of design for five-seater electric planes? Challenge for design. Um, so right now, the the challenge is uh, well. So for the design itself, um, I think the main thing is to integrate. Uh, the new components and uh, and the airplane. Now, the design is one thing, but like for example, Ampere does not make the component. We uh, have the component from the suppliers. So in terms of uh, the components, the suppliers are not the typical because you know, for example, typically the airplanes didn't have the motors, right, or, or inverters. And so these are the new suppliers. And so even though you have design, a design that requires certain performance, the design is not really such a big difference. Mm -hmm. It's such a big challenge, but it's trying to get it from the supplier to, because they're building it for the first time. And so I think that's really the key. Uh, the key is in terms of uh, we're doing this new thing. You have a new supplier base. And of course, this new supplier base has to do all kinds of testing on its components. So for example, like the, um, the batteries, they have to go through the DO311, uh, all the testing. And by the way, a lot of that uh, certification kind of standards was, uh, if you remember the 787, when it first started the Dreamliner, they had the lithium ion battery issues, you know, catching fire and so on. So the FAA has some very, very stringent testing requirements for that. And so, but the thing is that now the uh, lithium ion batteries are improving and, um, but still, you know, we have to, the, the test procedures and so on, they themselves are also standards that are evolving as well. So, um, so that's why this whole new supplier for the design is probably the biggest challenge here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Got a question I like very much from Philippe. Uh, who's asking, do you have a flying car project in mind? And how do you see their potential versus electric planes? <laughs> That's a really good question. I like uh, it. So uh, flying car, you know, it's kind of a dream. And, you know, in, in lots of cartoons and so on, people have already <laughs> shared that. And, and this is something I think sooner or later it would happen. But the uh, point is, in fact, that's what, you know, earlier on we talked about this electric vertical takeoff and landing uh, vehicles. So that's kind of moving towards that. Um, but we got ourselves in kind of a, a situation where if we have flying cars, uh, we're going to have allow everybody to fly them. You know, because uh, I don't even like to drive my car, you know, especially sometimes when the traffic is so jammed up and everything, it's just not fun. <laughs> and so you would like to have autonomous uh, flying cars so that not everybody has to go pay your dues and get a uh, pilot license mm -hmm. to fly and drive, right? And so you, you're talking about autonomous. Well, in terms of autonomous, and I know that you have a speaker next time too <laughs> on the autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm you're interfacing with the existing system. Uh, 
um, because in the existing system, you've got other airplanes flying and you have all, all these things. And so uh, a lot of the rules are not there yet. And so your autonomous system has to be developed to accommodate all that and be integrated into the existing uh, air traffic management. By the way, air traffic management is still using voice to communicate. I mean, we're talking about TRL level of, you know, we're talking about technologies like autonomy and so AI and so on that is way already, you know, uh, way developed. And here in the air traffic management system, for example, when I fly an airplane, the first thing I have to do is contact uh, control. You know, on the ground, I want to taxi somewhere, I contact tower on the ground, and then I contact tower where I'm going and so on. It's all voice. And it's not just the small airplanes, it's big airplanes too. And so this voice communication has got to change or has got to shift to something much faster, right? And uh, especially when you have, um, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of uh, small flying cars around. I mean, you can't afford to have voice communication anymore. So all those communication, command and control and all of that have to change. And so it, it's very exciting. Um, but just the airplane or the car itself, the, the physical design is really not that much of a challenge. It's really how you fit into the system and safely operate within the system. No, oh, thank you. Just out, out of interest on that note, are there, it's maybe too early to say, but do you have any sort of statistics about if such flying cars, because of the amount of space in the air versus on the roads, if they're safer or if autonomous ones are safer than people flying, do you have any data about that at all? Uh, there's not a whole lot of data. In fact, there's, uh, that's one of the reasons why these EV tolls are still, you know, trying to, uh, trying to do the flight mm -hmm. demonstrations and trying to work out just how to do the uh, communication and the system case. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, you know, um, everybody has cell phones. Everybody has these uh, wireless devices, right? You communicate and so on. Yeah. Well, you can't control the, uh, the flying cars, uh, I mean, in terms of the communication and so on. You can't depend on the wireless network that we have. It's got to be some dedicated network. And that network has, I mean, because, you know, you can't have a failure or, or my system come down and say, hey, you need an upgrade <laughs> to your software mm -hmm. version or something in the middle of the flight, right? And so uh, all of the network aspect has to be uh, robust improved such that it's very robust and safety and okay the, not only safety then that system has to be certified mm -hmm. because and to certify that you know what are the standards to certify that you know so the software certification uh is is kind of a challenge and another thing is like cyber attack you know imagine if uh, all those are yeah. on network and then you have autonomy and so on and, uh, you know, I'm sure once that's rolled out, somebody will be able to uh, attack and, or, you know, get in. And if, yeah. you know, imagine if some uh, bad character uh, got a hold of a whole, for example, 737 size uh, aircraft, that could be a weapon. It's, it's yeah. bad. It's, this whole thing is a cyber physical system kind of discussion. And it's, uh, there's a lot of challenges there. Okay. No, no, that's interesting. Um, I've got another interesting question from David, and we've touched on the, the design of some of the futuristic aircraft before you said about the, the vertical aircraft um, and there's the, the new V-shaped plane, which is uh, effectively two, two tubes with wings, to use David words. But David is asking, regarding the design of, of future aircraft, why are we still looking at tubes with wings? Are there any other creative designs in, in mind that are coming up? Yeah, that's another good question. In fact, um, I think uh, the, the question really has to do with uh, these big manufacturers, because as you know, right now, there's a sort of a duopoly of, uh, you know, Boeing and Airbus, and of course, China's Comac is really trying to, you know, come up to speed. But even then, you know, uh, Boeing and Airbus have been building great airplanes for, uh, you know, Boeing for more than 100 years and Airbus also many, many years. Mm -hmm. And they're doing very, very well in, uh, in, you know, getting the efficiency and everything. 
And so, for example, within Boeing, there's been, you know, a blended wing body, um, which is kind of a kind of flying wing type of thing. And it's, uh, it could attain really good efficiency and uh, all that good stuff. But it couldn't go forward because imagine when you have something like that, uh, the whole manufacturing, whole uh, perhaps even supply chain, you know, down to second, third tier would have to change. And that is cost. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, you know, as Boeing and Airbus both have backlogs to their airplanes. And so really the question is who can pump out these airplanes as fast as possible. So that whole process, for example, Boeing was a, building 40, 40 to 50 uh, 737s, uh, you know, per month, or at least uh, one per day. And I think Airbus is uh, up to 60 or something uh, per month. And so whoever that uh, will pump out slower, you know, they would lose, uh, you know, they will be losing out on the market. And so when they become so good in doing that, it's very hard for them to adopt a new configuration. And that's why innovation, I think, I believe in aerospace is more than likely in this case to happen starting from smaller uh, aircraft companies. And, um, and uh, going back to that flying V, I think it's really uh, an awesome design. Um, but um, I think in order to really convert to something like that, say Airbus converting to something like that, it would take decades. Okay, oh, thank you. Um, another good question from David, is there a market for hybrid airplanes? Oh, yes. I think um, so. Our airplanes are hybrid. And uh, the thing is that right now with the de energy density, it's, uh, it's still too early uh, for all electric. I mean, you can have all electric airplanes. And we have seen in the news that a couple of uh, uh, small, small projects of all electric already are uh, demonstrating flights. But um, they have very, very, very limited range, you know, like maybe a mile or two or something like that. And there are applications for, for such uh, flights, but your market will be very, very limited. Um, and that's why Ampere has gone on the, road, uh, on the route of uh, hybrids um, from the get-go rather than uh, all electric. Okay, no, makes sense. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So someone is asking regarding the manufacturing of uh, the electric aircraft, is that using environmental, uh, environmentally friendly materials? And assuming that there is a boom in the sector, what's the, the ESG and, and looking at the environmental contribution on the manufacturing side? Yeah, so definitely uh, we will be looking into, I mean, you know, if you have, <laughs> if you have an airplane that is uh, going to be sustainable, then, you know, it doesn't make sense that you will have the material that is not, uh, that's not environmentally friendly, that's not sustainable. Uh, but another thing is that uh, particularly for the interior of the airplane, uh, everything has, or I think even the, the other parts of the airplane, it has to pass the toxicity and flammability test. And so the materials, I'm not a materials uh, expert, but definitely uh, the uh, flammability is one of the most important thing. Uh, and as far as environmentally friendly, I think that's a goal that we, the whole industry is working towards. No, thank you. Um, what is, so, well, Simon is asking, how are you addressing containment of batteries in the case of thermal uh, runway? Simon <laughs> means by that. Yeah, Simon must be an expert on this because uh, uh, DO311, that's the whole idea, you know. So Boeing came up with this uh, containment thing by building a steel box around it. Um, as for the uh, smaller airplane, uh, we are uh, trying to contain uh, at the module level as well as the pack level. And the specific, uh, the specific uh, uh, approach I cannot share here. Um, but we have to demonstrate that for the certification. And yes, that's one of the most important requirements. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from Akul for you regarding funding. You, you mentioned earlier that the fundraising is the largest part. Um, are you currently raising an additional round of funding? Who are your current backers? And if so, what series are you on? Oh, good question. Uh, so currently we're uh, Series A, and uh, I, I believe we're uh, closing soon. And so far we've raised about 10 million. And um, 
However, uh, we also leverage other fundings uh, such as uh, the NASA, because NASA has a uh, uh, project where they, uh, it's a, we have to compete for that. And I can't say the specifics, but um, uh, we're one of the final um, uh, competitors in that in that project. And so we're leveraging NASA and also uh, the US uh, uh, DARPA, not DARPA, ARPA-E uh, also has a series of fundings for maturing the component technologies. And so we are um, leveraging that funding as well. And we do have other small, smaller fundings from the Air Force uh, and uh, let me see anything else. So uh, the, the thing is that we do have VC fundings as well as the uh, other government lab fundings for this. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, we, we always welcome more funding. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder that's why he asked. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned earlier when you were talking about the, the cost of electric air travel that um, the, the electricity was cheap in some countries partly because of uh, government subsidies is is electric um, air travel cheaper in general due to government subsidies and they're asking if if so how sustainable is that especially in countries where um, current government is is doubting climate change and isn't perhaps sourcing their electricity from the most sustainable sources yeah so that's kind of a complex question um, because um, in, in fact there's good studies of for the U.S. part, at least, uh, in terms of uh, you know the electricity costs, because uh, you know right now, for example, in that chart I showed, uh, a lot of the airports are becoming you know energy hubs, and for example, the first airport that's 100% uh, sustainable is uh, the Chattanooga, uh, and also uh, yeah, so Chattanooga Airport. And, um, and so in doing that, uh, but even that, you know, at the megawatt level, it's still not enough. And uh, just assuming that you do have enough uh, uh, electricity at the airport from the grid, um, but the uh, power provider will still uh, decide on their rates based on just uh, how, how much there is in the, in the demand. And if everybody needs certain demand at some peak hours, the, the rate will still uh, increase, not mm -hmm. decrease. And uh, similarly, I mean, if you go to the other parts of the world, uh, things can be a little different. But for example, like uh, in China, uh, on the whole Western side of China, there are just, you know, it's, uh, they're just starting to look at uh, some of those uh, sustainable energy because uh, there's plenty of sunshine and also wind and so on. And so it's a great opportunity for them to directly go, it, just like in the telecom industry where uh, China went uh, directly, in many places went directly to the um, wireless instead of the ground infrastructure. And so for aviation, they could basically leapfrog and go into the sustainable energy and you know, generating this kind of sustainable aviation uh, at the same time. Well, there's other parts of the world, you know, such as uh, Africa and uh, other uh, parts of Asia where uh, the energy, uh, the current energy grid uh, is maybe not as developed as uh, you know, Europe and uh, US. They could also start looking into the um, the plans for sustainable energy generation, and especially if it's at the airport and so on, um, I think a lot of that uh, would have to be coupled with their uh, the, the specific country economics plan, and and so that's not really for me to <laughs> to comment. Um, but I think there's a lot of opportunities, and um, and so right now I think around the world it's it's really. Uh, you know, the sustainable aviation is almost at a level playing field. There's a lot of opportunities for, for the different com countries. And it really depends on the policies and the government uh, uh, specific commitment uh, to make this happen. Okay, thank you. Rob is asking, do you see electric jet engines becoming a reality? Um, well, so the thing with the jets is that, you know, it takes, uh, you know, it's an air breathing and it burns uh, some kind of fuel. It is possible to have a hybrid of uh, jet and uh, electric, 
And in fact, uh, you know, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner was kind of a beginning of that, but it just, it just uses the jet and, gener and a generator to generate the, uh, the, the energy, the power that's needed, uh, as well as the battery that's uh mm -hmm. that's drawing the electricity so some kind of uh hybrid together with the uh, generator i believe is is doable um i'm sure uh, the big companies such as rolls royce or the others they're they're mm -hmm. looking into developing such uh such engine electric electric uh, uh air breathing sort of uh combination engines Okay, no, thank you. Um, I have a question on on sort of what what type of aircraft do you think is a, is a realistic future? Are we looking more, do you think, at sort of electric taxi aircraft or, or like you say, sort of privately flown or autonomous aircraft or are we more looking at a, a commercial system where you've got multiple people in an electric plane? What do you think is the reality for, for the majority of electric transport? That is a great question. Um, so right now, there's more than uh, 200 uh, projects or companies uh, that are working electric aircraft. Mm -hmm. And the majority of that are working these uh, kind of uh, EV tall, electric vertical takeoff mm -hmm. and landing type of aircraft. However, to put it into service, I would think um, probably a fixed wing uh, passenger aircraft Mm -hmm. uh, small, uh, of course, to start with smaller, you know, maybe nine, nine seats, 19 seats, uh, four, even four, six seats will be uh, a good uh, mm -hmm. start because just because um, uh, the other EV toll parts, just because you have vertical takeoff and landing doesn't mean you can take off and landing everywhere. Uh, so, you know, for example, Uber Elevate, they have... Uh, you know, these uh, fancy, uh, almost like science fiction type of uh, uh, vertiport they have, mm -hmm. which um, will have, uh, you know, these ports where, you know, the air, uh, the EV toll come in and vertically land and take off and would draw, like drawers, they go in and out of the building and so on. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of, like I mentioned, the air traffic management issue, a lot of the, um, uh, communication networking issues uh, so those will have to be absolutely uh, flight tested and uh, uh, and and bulletproof you know safety before because you know as long as you have one that mm -hmm. has an accident or something I think it's gonna set back for many many years and uh, so currently I think China has authorized uh, Ihang which is a, a EV tall mm -hmm. company to start doing some uh, local uh, local restricted mm -hmm. flights, and um, so we'll see how that goes. And I do know that in the UK, there's uh, you know the uh, drones doing some um, uh, parcel sort of uh, uh, delivery from you know some in some remote areas. So I think that will happen. It's just a matter of time. But probably the first ones will be the electric uh, fixed wing aircraft okay. because do they take you, off and land from the airports. Yeah. Do, do you have an idea of, of time frames for the sort of the, the parcel delivery, the food food delivery drones or <laughs> food delivery drones? I think that may happen. Uh, <laughs> I, I think the test runs are already happening. Yeah. Um, the drones, uh, you know, gosh. Maybe it's, a few years. It's, it's, it's my favorite subject. I can't wait to hear more about that. We've got <laughs> Jeff, uh, who's, who's our speaker next week, talking about autonomous, uh, uh -huh. autonomous air travel and, and drone deliveries and everything. So he's joining us same time next week. So he just commented that everyone should come listen next week. So um, then we've got one last question for you, um, Suzanne. Uh, Andrew is asking, could you explain how the boundary layer ingestion unit works and how we could expect to see it used in the future of aviation and it would be helpful for everyone else if you could explain what the boundary layer ingestion unit is please <laughs> well that depends on whether andrew is a, a, a aerodynamics person or uh, <laughs> some other background because the boundary layer because you know every flying uh, object will have a boundary layer because when the air particle uh, is right at the surface of a vehicle or of any mm -hmm. object, 
is is not moving so it's zero velocity is is stuck to the boundary stuck to the surface and so uh the boundary layer creates a lot of drag because of that because you know the the air from uh, from the outside has to drag all of this you know all of these particles off the vehicle right so there's a boundary layer where the velocity goes from zero to the outside velocity mm -hmm. so that contributes to the drag of the fuselage which is quite large because it's one of the largest part of the airplane so if you have the boundary layer ingestion one which you know you have a ring outside that's a fan you know with a mm -hmm. ring outside it could suck off this boundary layer into uh the engine of course into the uh unit and so therefore accelerating the boundary layer of velocity. So reducing the dra drag in, in a way. So uh, it's, it's a great um, concept and uh, many, uh, many research groups in the universities have uh, done a lot of experiments on it. And um, so there's some very encouraging data. And uh, so uh, I think we'll see more of that in the coming years okay. um, but once again you know because that that trl is not as high as uh some of the other trls and so uh it, you probably won't see it on the airplane for maybe um, a few years still okay no thank you and uh, we've just got the last probably the most relevant topical question for you to finish on from david when will we be able to buy a ticket for a fully for a ride in a fully electric aircraft from London City Airport? Oh, uh, I think it may be as soon as 2025. Five. And from any other airport in the UK or? Uh, the other airports, maybe in Scotland, it may be earlier, mm -hmm. just because the Scottish government is really uh, committed to make uh, zero carbon happening. And, um, and I think I I'm really confident that is going to happen there. Okay. Uh, probably sooner. And also they have the infrastructure because you can't do this. Just say, okay, you're going to be at this airport. The airport has to have the infrastructure. Otherwise you can't do anything there. I mean, you have an airplane there. You can't charge. Sure. Still mm -hmm. exciting though. Thank you yeah. so much for joining us. Really, really grateful to you for giving up your time to Jeff in the attendees for, for the introduction and to everyone for all of their questions. That, that was super, super interesting. Really, really grateful to you for that. That was really interesting. Um, and just lastly, thanks again to, to Tracer for sponsoring this Tech for Sustainability series. So they are a blockchain uh, connected value diamond chain platform working to build trust and um, in the diamond industry and ensure uh, traceability and authenticity of natural diamonds, as well as ensuring that the local communities where their mind are are fully paid and treated well. So big thank you to Tracer for making this series happen. But Susan, thank you so much. That was super interesting. Thank you, um, thank you for giving up your time. I, I'd love to hear more. I know you're recruiting and th there's a load of uh, engineers in our network who may be interested. So uh, we'll share that out in an email. But everyone, thank you very much for joining. And um, next week, same time, have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.